survivors of the Holocaust, Soviet Jews, Jewish school children. This Catholic woman knows them all, and tonight on Real to Real, you'll get to know her. You'll also get to know the real secret behind Snappy Toys. And being in the know about American Catholics is part of Father Andrew Greeley's job. We'll have a profile of him along with a visit to the lay minister of a Catholic college. Hello, I'm Sean Hughes Camp. And I'm Monsignor Charles Minor. Welcome to Real to Real. said in the past 20 years the church has changed and the Vatican Council is responsible for it they are told and it's true the second Vatican Council like every other council addresses itself to unity among Christians but the second Vatican Council did something different it addressed the idea of unity of Christians with non-Christians that's true and attaining an understanding of the non-Christian is one of the hardest challenges that faces a Christian today though things are changing fear mistrust and worse, have characterized the history of Christian-Jewish relations. Tonight on Real to Real, we have the story of a local woman who has done a lot to replace fear with respect and mistrust with understanding. Somewhat of a hatred or a deep antipathy toward Jews. And in the beginning of this little talk, when I started, I said, has any of this kind of anti-Semitism ever touched any of you? in any way, shape, or form, or have you ever heard... This woman, sitting in a classroom in a Jewish what? university, speaking about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust to a group of high school students, is not Jewish. She is Catholic. In fact, she's a Roman Catholic nun, and this meeting to discuss the horrors of hatred and prejudice is all in a day's work for Sister Gloria Coleman. Sister Gloria is the Associate Director of the Office for Ecumenism and Interreligious Affairs, a component of the Office for Urban Ministry of the Archdiocese. In her office decorated with awards from Jewish groups, she explained how her work grew out of the Second Vatican Council and its mandate to bishops to create the means for dialogue between Catholics and non-Christians. Vatican II, in its declaration Nostra Aetate, spoke to the repudiation of all forms of hatred of the Jew. This is the first time in our church history. The whole idea of proselytizing with regard to forced conversions of the Jew, the charge that the Jews indeed were Christ killers, all these things with regard to hatred of the Jew were to be forever by the church denounced. From that denunciation of what had caused so much sorrow and suffering to the Jew through history, now the people of the church were asked to move forward. We have to move forward now into a period of mutual respect and understanding. The Northeast Interfaith Congress is a group that I work with up in the Northeast. And just last, this past spring, we had a dialogue program going with these young people, Christian Jewish relations with eighth graders. We're going to talk about things we've heard about each other. We're not going to talk about things we think about each other. We're going to talk about things we heard <coughs> about each other. Not about each other, about Jews, Catholics, Protestants. What are some of the stereotypes? What are some of the prejudices that lie deep within our, our own hearts? I myself was in Israel at the time. I couldn't be part of that program. But when I came back, it was marvelous to hear the people who were involved, the facilitators who worked with these youngsters, realizing indeed we can't start too young. Person young talk, children really this. have their minds set yes. at a very so early age. So the younger we can work with children, the better. You know to avoid stereotypes. My grandmother had an experience with them. She was uh, <coughs> in a hotel and she Your looked out Jewish. The, yes. Yeah. She looked out the window from Laura Plus she was a the Ku Klux Klan burning across, 
In being involved with interreligious dialogue, we enter into those concerns of the Jews. And one of those concerns, of course, is how do we teach the lessons of the Holocaust? How do we help people to understand what indeed happened to the Jews? One way Sister Gloria and her colleagues do this is to arrange seminars, such as this one, that feature survivors of the Holocaust as speakers. Myself and the Jewish Community Relations Council have had a series of seminars that we hold at Gratz College, and we bring young people together across faith lines. And in doing that, we, it serves a twofold purpose. We're not only trying to teach them about the Holocaust, but we're introducing them to each other so that perhaps children who go to separate schools will begin to meet and have some of the stereotypes that we have in our psyches and in our imaginations just wiped away as a result of young people meeting and talking with each other. When I got to the gas chamber, we were told to undress, and as I undressed, the soldier said, the German soldier said, and the cop were there said, why don't you run? You weren't selected. We'll count till 10 and see if you can run. And I remember running. On the same day as this workshop, Sister Gloria attended a press conference at Philadelphia City Hall. It concerned another of her interests with the Jewish community, the plight of Jews in the Soviet Union. In my capacity as chairperson of the Philadelphia Interreligious Task Force on Soviet Jewry, it was indeed my pleasure and privilege to be part of the delegation that went to Jerusalem for the Third World Conference on Soviet Jewry. I know myself, having been to the Soviet Union twice recently, I know the urgency of the call. Andrei Sakharov spoke to Father Dreinen one day when he was in Moscow before he was exiled to Gorky. This was a while ago. And he said to Father Dreinen, only the Christians of America can liberate the Jews of the Soviet Union. Sister Gloria can speak with authority about Soviet Jews because she has been to Russia and met with some Jewish citizens and has worked on their behalf. One of the people she has helped is Alexander Slaypak, who now lives in the Philadelphia area with his wife and daughter. Though he didn't meet her until he came to the United States, Alexander says it was the efforts of Sister Gloria and others that helped him to get out of the Soviet Union. Beneath a picture of his parents, who have been waiting 13 years for permission to leave the USSR, Alexander spoke about life in his native land. Uh, I left Soviet Union uh, in 77 when uh, I finally got permission to leave the country. We applied, we, I mean the whole family, including my parents, we applied for an exit visa to leave Soviet Union uh, in April 1970, and it took me eight years to get out. Unfortunately, my parents are still in Russia. Uh, Can you give us an idea of what your day-to-day -day life was like while you were waiting permission to leave? There were many interrogations. There were many broken doors in our apartment. There was not always the reason why it was done, just uh, to keep us in the state of uh, nervousness, I would say. Um, they could enter your apartment any day, uh, any hour of the day, and uh, they can search for some literature, for some papers that they think are illegal from their point of view. Such things as Bible was confiscated several times from our apartment, and it was considered anti-Soviet literature. Why does the Soviet government persecute Jews specifically? Anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union is very strong, and it's historically going on for years. Whenever something goes wrong, Jews are to blame. They're like uh, scapegoats. What is life like for your parents who are in Russia now? Right now, they uh, are still hoping and uh, awaiting for the permission to leave the Russian state. Do they continue to work? No. In Soviet Union, when Jews apply for immigration, they lose their jobs. With my parents, it's happened so that about, uh, I would say, six months after we applied for immigration in 1970, they lost their jobs. 
both of them. My mother was uh, a physician, a uh, radiologist, and she couldn't find any job for her. And my father was an engineer, and he was uh, without a job as well. When you were living in Russia, waiting to be released, were you aware of the efforts of the ecumenical groups to free Soviet Jews? Oh, yes, yes. Um, we knew about this support for a long time. We felt that support. Yeah. We have hope to bring to those people. And I think it goes back to why, what we're all about. Why are we reaching out to other people in dialogue? Why are we trying to ensure that the Judeo-Christian morality and ethic will prevail in a world that is really on the verge of, well, catastrophe? We know that if we have anything to give, we give it in a spirit of togetherness. <sighs> Perhaps one of the most important things that Sister Gloria Coleman has done through her work with the local and international Jewish communities is to remind us all that the spirit of togetherness is also part of the Christian Judeo tradition. We're going to introduce you to some more interesting people here on Real to Real tonight. Father Andrew Greeley is known lately as the author of some bestsellers. Coming up, we have a profile of him in which he discusses the state of Catholicism in the United States. And in People and Places, we'll meet the lay minister of a Catholic college. Stay with us. Donna McKenzie is the campus minister at Albertus Magnus College in New Haven, Connecticut. Her original career hopes to heal people as a doctor eventually evolved into a desire to help them spiritually. After earning a Master of Divinity degree, she welcomed the unusual challenge of becoming a lay minister at a Catholic college. Ministerially speaking, I think, that in the church, campus ministry probably offers one of the greater uh, fields of experience for women. Um, I think a really important part of what my job as campus minister here is simply presence, to offer a place for students to come in, to be able to ask the questions that they're asking about their faith and who God is in their life, and um, to do that freely and to do that openly. The most challenging aspect of my job, I think, is just helping students to um, admit to, that it's okay to be a religious person. It's okay to believe in God. I bring an awareness to students that being a religious person and being involved in the life of the church and being concerned about um, gospel and living gospel values is a very ordinary task and something that, you know, if you take seriously being Christian, everyone is really charged with. Donna also coordinates daily masses at Albertus Magnus, where her ministry takes on a more traditional form. And so we respond out of gratitude for the ways in which our lives have been blessed. We know that part of Jesus' miracles include helping us to recognize this tremendous love that is inside of ourselves. It's this love that allows us to experience new life and new hope. I try to involve students as much as possible in what we do here, so to really help them develop leadership skills 
um, so that they can go back out, you know, into their parishes and, and really be women of, of leadership in, in faith. Preaching is an exercise of the, of the creative art. Huh? It's an exercise, if you will, in poetry, an exercise in imagination. And so you have to read more theology, scripture, but also literature, fiction, poetry. Uh, you have to stimulate and challenge your own creative imagination to be able to communicate with others. Andrew Greeley, sociologist, columnist, religious writer, novelist, and priest, is one of the most controversial figures in the American Catholic Church today. He has written over 50 books, including a best-selling fictional novel, The Cardinal Sins. His outspoken opinions often arouse rage and curiosity from bishops, his fellow clergy, and members of the laity. When, when a priest does something that's a little bit unusual, uh, he's likely to be in trouble with, with a fair number of people. And I think the first book uh, earned me lots of enemies, and it's, uh, it's been pretty much the same ever since. I should also add, though, that the first book earned me a lot of friends. It's as though you walk into the room and, and people split into two camps. Here at the University of Arizona, Father Greeley serves as a professor of sociology. He is also the senior researcher for the National Opinion Research Center, where his work has helped him discover a great deal about American Catholicism. When we first did our, our research on Catholics back in the early 60s, the, the proportion of those who were raised Catholics who had left the church was about 9%. Now it's up to around 15%. That's an increase, but still that means 85% of the people who are born Catholic are still Catholic. And what we're getting now is a kind of a uh, uh, life cycle phenomena, where young people tend to drift away from the church in their 20s, early, middle, late 20s, and then uh, from the years, their 30s on, begin to drift back to the church, so that by the time they're in their 40s, they're as likely to be as devout as your parents. I don't, I don't see any large permanent loss in this life cycle phenomenon. I think rather the problem is that when they want to come back to the church uh, at the times of the various uh, turning points in the life cycle, we make it difficult for them. Instead of celebrating their return and welcoming them back with open arms, we set up programs and guidelines and rules and regulations, which if anything defeats their, their intention to return to the church. We asked Father Greeley his opinions as to why Catholics leave the church in the first place. The biggest single problem we have is the quality of Sunday preaching. Uh, and the preaching is the most important priest of thing, uh, the most important thing a priest does, and only 15, 20 percent of our people think we're good at it. So that, that's the most critical problem. Second most critical problem is the role of women. Our research would indicate that maybe as many as a million and a half women, Catholic women, who don't go to church regularly because they're angry at the church. They see the church as trying to keep them in their old gender roles, narrow, rigid gender roles. And the third greatest problem is the vocation shortage. Father Greeley also thinks that many Catholics have become alienated by the church's teaching about sexuality. Um, I think authority has lost its credibility. The, the, um, and, 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 and sex did it. I mean, they just at some stage of the game, 1969, 1970, to pick a time, the Catholic population decided that the Pope and the hierarchy simply didn't know what they were talking about when, when they were talking about sex, and turned them off. Uh, and you can harangue them about this, you can tell them they can't do what they have done. They think we are wrong on birth control and divorce, and because we're wrong there, they're not sure that they're, they're ready to take us seriously on anything else. Mind you, they won't be contemptuous of us, they won't throw bombs at us, they'll uh, let us do our things. Uh, so long as we administer the sacraments to them and, and, uh, and, and keep the parishes going, um, they won't be violent, they won't be commanding clerical, they just won't listen. I think, you know, candidly, the same thing is true in, in, in social action and even nuclear weapons. Uh, the nuclear weapon business, the hierarchy is just catching up where the laity is on that one. Um, and, you know, if it turns out that in a specific instance the lay people think those in authority are speaking wisely, then they will listen. But now the burden of proof is on those of authority, in authority, to establish that they are speaking wisely. Although Father Greeley can be appreciated for his frankness and candor, his controversial opinions are not always in agreement with the bishops and the laity. 
So every new thing I do in the way of writing uh, is likely to stir up the same reaction. What's he up to? Uh, why is he doing sociology? Why is he writing columns for the secular press? Why is he writing novels? On the other hand, there's lots of people that, that like what I do and respect it, so it, it probably evens out in the end. Down in Baltimore, there is a church that provides a program for manufacturing and education to high school dropouts. Now that might surprise you, but so are the name of this firm's products, Snappy Toys. It began as a summer youth employment workshop at Govins Presbyterian Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Now. Four years later, it's developed into a full-time community outreach ministry, one that is shaping the lives of its young participants. Well, I think a church owes a responsibility to the community in which it's based, and I also think that the church has to show the community what Christianity means, and it has to do with changing the lives of individuals. Realizing the high number of unemployed youth around the Baltimore area, Reverend John Sharp approached the city with plans to open a carpentry workshop specifically designed for lower income high school dropouts. With backing from his parishioners and the community, the Govins Youth Employment Workshop was born. Initially, only furniture refinishing was attempted, but as the students' motivation and willingness to work with wood grew, they branched out into other areas of carpentry. As the popularity of their products spread, they changed their name to Snappy Toys Incorporated. We, first we have to get the width of the board so we measure the board the board is two and a half inches if you notice the table saw the teeth are set that one to, a to uh, break the cycle of uh, youth unemployment and drop out in society and change their lives so they can they can live positive productive lives um, I imagine from the government's point of view they like this because this is not this is breaking the cycle of welfare generations where parents and children and grandparents are all being are all coming right down the welfare rolls and we're getting them back into employment um, our primary interest isn't that our primary interest is helping young people live a positive and, and, a, and a, the abundant life that Christ talked about I came that you'd be free and it's a form of bondage that if we want to talk in theological terms we're we're trying to break that cycle and give them freedom Although not a member of the parish, Janet Palmer was impressed with the program sponsored by the Govins Presbyterian Church, especially the one aimed at youth employment. She became the first director of Snappy Toys. We opted for carpentry partly because it was an interest of mine. I had had an interest in refinishing furniture, and it was something I thought, too, would be of interest to a lot of the males. Um, they enjoyed working with their hands. They enjoyed carpentry. It was something, I think, that that would motivate them and interest them. It's very hard many times to get these kids motivated. I think the program's very helpful for me. Uh, I'm learning a, a trade. At the same time, I'm getting my GED. I'm gonna finish school some way. And I feel it's helping me out by that. In addition to working in the carpentry shop, 
The 16 to 21 year olds spend 10 hours a week in classroom studies aimed at helping them obtain their high school equivalency diploma. 815, is that the lowest yeah. fraction? Can it be reduced any farther? No. Okay. okay. Daniel, you want to erase that? And Teresa, you two want to try a couple real quickly? Most of the students that we get have very few role models outside of their peer groups. They are unmotivated, they are undisciplined, and we really do see some changes. Snappy Toys becomes almost a family for them. They belong, they have something to work for, something to work toward. They have good role models, not only through the staff of Snappy Toys, but through the church involvement. Um, there really are some major changes. You, you really see them suddenly hook into something, to belong to something, and it gives them self-esteem. It makes them want to work harder for, for some sort of tangible goal. So far, I learned a lot. You know, we make toys and things. Um, I like it. I think I should be in here till, the, till I graduate. The church is letting us use their facilities. Uh, they've been cooperative with us. And uh, th what, they, what they've been doing is helping Snappy Toys a lot. And by them helping Snappy Toys, it's also helping us because now we have a job to do. The city of Baltimore also realizes the program's overall benefit to the community. As witnessed by Marion Pines, director of the Mayor's Office of Manpower Resources. And what this program has done is really provide some educational resources, some job training, some job habits, some sense of how you, can, you participate in a community, some sense of what the job world out there is going to require of you. And so it gives kids the skills and the, and the internal strength to be able to deal with life and to deal with maybe temporary periods of unemployment. But we think it, this program and this kind of holistic approach, if you will, um, gives people both the technical skills and the inner skills so that they can be self-reliant, that can be self-sufficient. Through the city, Snappy Toys recently received funds to construct a building on the church grounds to house their carpentry workshop. Here, they will also be better equipped to sell their products to the general public, as well as distribute them to numerous retail outlets in the area. If it's the quality of a city's labor force that attracts industry to a community, then Snappy Toys and programs like it are definite assets. But it's the internal pride and building of self-esteem that has made Snappy Toys a true success story. This is an effort of the church to make an intervention and change the lives of these young people. And we've, we've got some exciting stories to tell about the results of the efforts in three years where young people stop by, successful, holding down a job, uh, positive attitude, uh, engaged, getting married, setting up homes. Um, so we think it's really worthwhile. We hope you'll join us next week on Real to Real. Good night. Good night, and God bless you.